an incredible book and um, I saw something and I also saw a confirmation of something I've taught for years that I didn't realize was in John. And although I've read this book many, many times and I love the Gospel of John, but I caught a new insight from when Yeshua, Jesus, uh, was speaking to Nicodemus. And I want to share that with you guys. All right. And, um, and listen, I'm just going to say this because I, I get from time to time, I get emails from, uh, from different friends and, and they're always telling me that if you're not saying Yeshua or Yahshua, uh, speaking about Jesus, that you're just, basically you're not saved. And I'm like, that is something that just drives me nuts because people fail to realize the entire world does not speak Hebrew, let alone how do we really know how to pronounce Yeshua's name? Some say it's Yah for Yahweh, uh, but then again, there is a debate over whether or not Yahweh's name is Yah with a Y-A-H sound or Yeh, like as in uh, Nehemiah Gordon um, believes he's found documents that says Yehovah. Uh, there's all different types of, of ideas, and uh, I would probably take the Yeh not so much for the vowels that he found, but when God says to Moses, they will, uh, you know, Moses says to God, he says, they're going to ask me, Mashimo, what is his name? What do I say to them? And Moses says, or excuse me, God says to Moses, Ve'yomer Eliahem, which means, and, and God says to them, you know, Ihaye Asha Ihaye, okay? Ehaye, ye, there it is right there, the Yehovah or Yeshua, because he says, I am which I am, or I am which that I will be. It's literally like in a future tense right there, proving that he will prove that he is God himself, right? Now, oddly enough, in the uh, Eastern uh, Hebrew text, uh, the Aleppo Codex, we actually have the Ihaye is what Abraham refers to God as well. Just like God is told to Moses when he says, what shall I tell them, who, who shall I tell them sent me? It's Ihaye, Asha Ihaye. All right, and so I find that interesting. So, so many different variations, and therefore, you know, to come out and emphatically say, you must say Yahshua or Yeshua or, you know, every tongue, every language has a way of pronunciation based on their language. So it's just, it's, God knows the heart of the people. They fall in love with Yeshua, with Jesus Christ, and it's a love affair. My grandmother, my dad's mother, who was a Jew that spoke fluent Yiddish, uh, and uh, she's from Europe, and uh, you know, when she was 77 years old, Yeshua came to her, and it was a love affair. I, I never, in fact, it was an inspiration to me. I was the first one in my family to believe that Yeshua was tr tr truly the Messiah, even before my grandmother did, uh, because I was eight years old. But at 18 years old, my grandmother was now believing in Yeshua, and it blew me away, you know? And the love affair, it impacted my life because I had never seen someone that was so in love with Him. And that's what happened to my own wife as well. Something happened to her one day, and she spent two days in the very presence of Almighty God with Yeshua, with Jesus, and it was a love affair. And so, you know, like I said, though, in every, every language, every tongue, uh, they pronounce His name differently, including the divine name that people pronounce today, different variations. So I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Now, for the Jewish people, they don't like to pronounce the name of God. They normally say Hashem, which in Hebrew means the name. Uh, but it also in the, uh, uh, what is that, the, the, that ancient uh, writing, like what the, uh, oh gosh, I forget the, the name of the Syriac, no, not a Syriac, I forget the name of the writing it is, but Hashem also means the rocket. So, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things mean different things in different languages. So I don't want to get hung up on languages there, in that case there. Let's get right into this. John chapter 3, might edit this out on the Noon Institute, the first part, because we really don't need all this in there. 
Uh, but I share that with those of you watching on live stream. It looks like we've got a nice little crowd over there. Not too many, but you know, a nice little group there. So blessings to all of you, and we sure, certainly love you there on live stream. And I'm wanting to get live stream really up and going on a regular basis. Uh, I have major difficulties, though, in knowing what to do to set up this to where we can broadcast multiple, on multiple channels at one time. There is a brother, and I cannot find his contact now, out of California that was willing to help me on this. Um, and he was telling me what I had need of. I took the pictures of all my equipment to send to him because I don't even know how to use my own equipment. So, uh, but hopefully we'll get that where we can do that and make a better experience for everyone. Let's go into this, though. So, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. We're reading from the King James Version here online. Uh, said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto, you, unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows, uh, bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. All right, I'm going to pause just for a second. I want to back up. I want to share something with you that I think a lot of times is misunderstood. Verse 5, when Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Most people associate this with water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I will agree with you in part on that because I believe water baptism is essential in the fact that we know that it was given by uh, Jesus as, as, a, as an ordinance. John was baptizing. This is actually a Hebrew, um, a Hebrew belief to begin with. We have the, the mikvah, uh, where it's a ritual cleansing. Before you would go up to the temple, during the uh, temple days, you would, you would dip yourself in the mikvah. Oddly enough, there is one active mikvah in Israel. Only one. And that mikvah, I shared a video with you guys out on this when I was over in Israel. It's outside the very quarter that was called, uh, what did they call that? Was it the, called, I think it's called the Essene Quarter. I think that's what they called that section there, where the apostles actually gathered in that quarter there on Mount Zion. This is also where the Church of St. James is. And outside the ancient ruined gates, and I've actually photographed that there for you guys, video that showed you that, where you would enter into the city there. There is a mikvah there. It still has water in it, unlike any of the other mikvahs that I've seen around the temple. This is the only one that still has the water, which seems to me, symbolically speaking, that indeed that had to have been where the early believers gathered at. It just seems odd. And oddly enough, and I hope we don't lose battery on the live stream, I got about 20% on there. Uh, oddly enough, the Jews are still using this mikvah to this day. All right? But, so I do agree that water baptism is essential, but at the same time, I also know, like in the case of the thief on the cross, uh, he believed Yeshua at that time. He had no time to go and be baptized. So we have to then reevaluate what does Jesus mean when he says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. All right? Because you have to be born. And of course, when we're immersed in the water, immersing in the water is not being born, but yet it's a signification of the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, right? All right, and then notice so in verse 6, what does he say? That which is born of the flesh, make sure I got the speakers on, okay, uh, is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, the antecedent to this of born of the flesh would be actually be here the being born of the water because it's referring back to what he just said. And of course, we know that when a child is born, 
the water breaks in the mother, then the child comes forth. That's how you know the child is about to be born. So when Jesus said, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, I have a feeling, because he said that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He's separating the two, too, as well. Yes, you have to be born of water. You have to come into the world in a natural life, but you also have to be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit itself, right? So, although I do believe that the born of the water, I believe it's a compound fulfillment. I believe water baptism is, is essential. You know, when you know you can't, or you know, are you able to? But I've also dealt with people on their deathbeds that couldn't even get baptized that believed at that moment then. Do I believe that they wouldn't make it as a result of that? No, not at all. Just like the thief, thief on the cross. They just didn't know any better until that hour. All right? But, so I think that that has to deal with the being born of the flesh. All right? But go on though. Watch what he says though. It's going to get very interesting. You're going to see... This, this water as well later. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, right? Now, we go on down. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Now, Jewish brothers, sisters that are watching this, because I may air this on Israeli News Live later down the road, I want to share something with you. You need to really pay, close, play, pay very close attention because you're going to see something here for yourselves that should have caused the Jewish people 2,000 years ago to recognize who the Mashiach was. So I'm really asking you guys to pay close attention. All right. We speak, see, verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. That's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if, you, if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. I always thought that was fascinating. The Son of Man, He came down, but yet the Son of Man, which is in heaven, He's in heaven, but yet here on the earth as well. Explain that one to me. And I'll hold that for later, because I don't want you to miss the thought in this. And as Moses, this is the key right here, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For, so, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this is dealing with being the born of the water and the Spirit. The Spirit, the water, and the Spirit. you got to watch. The water also has yet another symbology here. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. So I believe, as, as we say, Scripture has compound meanings, compound fulfillments. So yes, does the water represent the baptism? Yes. But it also represents another part, not just the birth of a child. There's still yet another part of the water that's important. For God sent not His Son in the world to be condemned, to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not, is, is, excuse me, he that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. All right, now we're going to stop there. All right, because I really want to focus on where this, this part about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness on the brass pole, right? Got to get into that. Let's go back then to Numbers chapter 21. And this is where we, we look into this. And it's, it's really the key in the verbiage is what you have to look at. All right. Now, as we know the story, what happened? The children of, the, of, the, of Israel, they were, they were in the wilderness. Uh, they had just had, uh, you know, a great uh, uh, conquering of the Canaanites. And don't forget, when you look at Israel today and we say, 
Well, they're to drive out the occupants like they did back 3,400 or whatever the number of years ago is what, 3,500 years ago, uh, that they were to drive out the children, excuse me, to drive out the, the, the today they're to drive out all the, uh, the inhabitants of the land. No, <clears throat> that's completely false. Because God commanded through Moses to drive out the Canaanite, the Hittite, the, Hiv the, the Perzite, the, all these different names of these, these nations that were there in the land because of not only the idolatry, but they were also giants. Through their idolatry and through their, uh, their, their evil ways that they were doing, they had figured out how to bring forth giants back into the world again. The only way you're going to get giants into this world is once again to cohabitate with demonic beings. Remember, the spies, they went down in the land, they were all giants, and they were scared to death of them, all right? So let's just clear that up. We don't have that issue today, not in Israel. And the bad thing is, is or, or another issue that we can look at as well, is many, even amongst the Palestinians, you have many of them that are believers in Yeshua, all right? Now, I know there's a lot of radicals there, too, but we go into that in the news broadcast, what's going on there prophetically. They're being riled up on both sides, you know, that's all to bring about a new world order. This is why I'm again, I'm not against my own people. I love my people. I want them to see that Yeshua is the Mashiach. Right? And let me tell you something. There are prominent rabbis that listen to this program. Don't kid yourself uh, to think that we don't have an impact on renowned rabbis in Israel. All right? So, we're trying to do our part, and I want you to be educated as well to where you can witness to, to the Jewish people that don't know Yeshua and can share something with them that might benefit them. All right, so let's look at what he says here. So they, they go there. They're journeying through the wilderness there. They come up to the land of Edom there, which is right there on the border. It's on the border to come into the modern state of Israel today, the very land, right? Now, God... He doesn't want them to war against Esau's descendants because he said, I've given them this land, right? But they, they begin to complain. They begin to moan and groan. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, verse 5. Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is no water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. All right? Now, <laughs> Christ was that bread that came down as he identifies himself. He says, I was that bread of life. But they hated it. So no wonder why they hated it, you know, 1,500 years down the road when Yeshua comes. They hated him even then. And when they, because of their hatred towards what God had given them to sustain their life in a desert, free, no toiling, no laboring, but you know what it is? It's like today. People have eat the same old food every single day. If I tell you, okay, you're going to have to eat eggs every day of your life. Or you're going to have to eat uh, uh, only wheat bread, you know, for the rest of your life, nothing else. Or for the next 40 years, that's all you're going to eat. People would get tired of it. I understand in that respect there. But God had given them the very bread of life. And they rejected that then. Now, here... My Jewish brother, sister, listen to me closely, brother, sisters. This is where you got to pay attention closely. Notice what's rejected. All right? The manna or manahu, as we say in Hebrew, that God had given them to sustain their life freely. Angels' food they were being given. They were rejecting of this. Verse 6 says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and against you, and pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make you a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to, uh, to pass that everyone that is bitten when he seeth it shall live. All right? 
And Moses made the serpent on the brass, uh, made the serpent of brass, and set it upon the pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he looked unto the serpent of brass, he lived. All right. Now, this is not just a. This is not up. Oh, just look. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Great. That's roa. Ro uh, ro ah. You know, if I say uh, for you to look at something, you know, and you're just going to see, like I see this, okay? And the oaz haze, all right? I see this. That's just seeing with your eye there, just, but it's just, doesn't mean that you're paying attention, right? All right, now in Hebrew right here, this is the word right here for, for, that's being used here. Ve hibit, okay? Hibit. Hibit is that form of the word which is to look intently, to really to consider it. Now, what's interesting, they had rejected Moses and God. They had rejected the very bread of life that was given unto them for the salvation of their souls. The very, what would you say this would be? They, had, they were rejecting the the very manna that was coming from the tree of life, which is Christ. He is that tree of life. Like in the Garden of Eden, when Moses, excuse me, when Adam, Adam and uh, Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and the tree of life was the very free gift that they were given. And the thing is, they actually had that life. And I know this. Some people have differed with me because they say, well, you know, Steve, God put a the cherubim's there to guard the way of the tree of life, and so therefore they had no access to that tree of life, so they never got the tree of life. That's not true, because the tree of life in Hebrew is, let's just, oh gosh, we got to pull this one up. I, 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 you know, I was going to pull this up, and then I thought, no, I'll wait. All right, let me go back. All right, here we go. Genesis chapter 3. All right. But of the fruit which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. All right? Now that's from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Uh, let me back up. Let me go a little further back because I've got to show you why all this is happening here. I think it's in chapter 2. All right? They went up and missed out of the earth. Okay, water the earth, the ground, the nostril. Okay, all right. Now here's here's one. Here's the verse seven is important. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right, right here. The ipak bepaav nishmar chayim veyachi adam lenefesh chaya. All right. That's, there's a key right there. He breathes in his nostrils, nishmat chayim, the, okay, all right, to, to, to him is a chayim, and that's life. He breathes life into him, okay? It's in the plural. But when God refers to man, beyahi, and it was, ha'adam, the man, la nefesh, his soul, Chaya, it becomes a feminine singular for his own soul. But he breathes in him Chayim, a multiple source of life. Why? Because Eve is already in him. All right? She's there. So therefore, God has to breathe into him more than one life because he's carrying that life. This kind of goes back to where Paul says, you know, when we read, uh, a lot of people get it mixed up and they, they kind of make it look like that God is dominating, you know. Uh, 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 let's see, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, and, 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 and then, of course, of the woman as well. Right? Now, but then what happens? It's actually the word source because, you know, the thing is, in other words, Christ come out of God, Adam created by Christ, and then the woman come from Adam's side. Because we know this because Paul then turns around and says, but neither is the man without the woman. Now, he's not talking about necessarily you being born of your mother, although it does apply that way too, but he's actually speaking prophesying of Christ, or he's talking about, not prophesying, but he's talking about Yeshua. Neither is the man without the woman. In other words, even though the woman came from the man, yet our Savior, Jesus Christ, came from Mary. You understand? Oh, this is so incredible. 
God had breathed in to Adam there. He breathed in that uh, he breathed in that life in the plural form. Now, if you go down further here in Genesis chapter 2, all right, all right, but then he gets into verse 17. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, that day you shall surely die. All right, now, all right, that's the only tree that he commands not to eat of. He doesn't command not to eat of the tree of life. The reason why the, 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 the angels were put there to guard the way of the tree of life, except man put forth his hand and eat and live eternally, is literally speaking of mankind because of all the souls that would be born after Adam and Eve. And God knew that if they ate in a fallen state and live eternally in a fallen state, it would be a disaster. All right? Now, so... Uh, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for the food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want you to notice. Okay? Alright. Okay, cool. The totally more The eighth ha, definite article, hey. Ha, chayim. Alright? The tree of life is a tree of chayim. What did God breathe into the nostrils of Adam? Chayim. So the chayim is the fruit from the tree of life. It's life itself. And this is what God breathed into Adam in a plural form. So he had already received. See, the tree of life is a free gift. You don't go partake. That tree gives to you. When God breathed into Adam and Eve, He breathed into them freely. And I say them because it says God in Genesis 1, God created He, male and female created He, them. Alright? And called their name Adam. That is mankind. And He breathed in Adam's nostrils the Chaim because it was two in there and therefore they had the life. But man itself became a Chaya, a living soul, in a singular, but it's a feminine, uh, ver a feminine usage there. Why? Because we are the bride of Christ. That's why the feminine is there, alright? So as a man, you are a bride to Christ in a feminine form because of your spirit that is given to you by the Holy Spirit, which makes it to where we can become one with Him, alright? Now, so... I say all these things, it's important. Now we're going to go back over to Numbers, and you have to understand, when Moses, when this issue was happening with these fiery serpents, this was the natural. Alright? In the natural, they were condemning God, and they were, they were condemning this manna that God had given them, and we know from the New Testament that Christ was the manna. He was the bread that came down from God. He said, God, he said, he, and he claims that he's the one that did it. He said, I was that bread of life. Okay? Now, but because they had rejected him, because that's that was Israel rejecting Christ back then. God took and put and they sent the serpents in. The serpents began to attack them and kill them. That was a reflection of the Garden of Eden. That was showing you that spiritually man had died in the Garden of Eden. And now we're seeing, now man is dying in the natural. His natural body was dying for, for because of what? Rejecting the way of life. The way of life was Christ, and Christ was the manna in the wilderness, and they were rejecting that way of life. And now we're seeing here in the book of Numbers that God had, had commanded Moses, lift up the serpent on the pole. Right? And if you look, alright, and that's not just any kind of look, the habit el nachash, all right, then you would live. Okay, he would live if he just, if he sincerely looked and considered what he was looking at, that this is what caused him his fall was his own sins. And it's the same thing according to what is written in Genesis. It is the serpent that beguiled Eve. 
and Christ was lifted up on the pole just as the brass serpent was. And if we looked to him, we would live. But in the case here, it was for the flesh. Now remember John, Jesus says here, we get down to 14, we see the brass serpent is lifted up on the pole, but he said, except the man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right? And then he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He was giving them the clue to know who he was. And then he refers down here in verse 14, he's referring to you as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is it? Flesh was flesh. They were dying because of the sins in the flesh. But the spirit of man is dying because of the spiritual sin all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So when God says to Israel that he would, you know, to Moses, he would raise up a prophet like and unto me from among your brethren. And God says why he did it. And that was because when God was willing to come down to them in the form that he was in the pillar of fire. You know, the angel of his presence was an amber burning fire. And they rejected that. They could. They said, let not God speak lest we die. Let only Moses speak. So then God said, okay, I'll raise up a prophet like and unto, you know, it says to Moses, like and unto you. From among their brethren. And, and everything in which he says, you must hear. Now listen to me. That's a prophet. That isn't the Talmudic Jews that are out there uh, that, that, that have said they had the oral law of Moses and so they write the Talmud and say this is was what God was saying to Moses and none of it works together. None of it matches the word of God. Now some rabbis, including my good friend Tovia Singer, will say to you that, well, you guys quote Paul as if it's the word of God. Well, we're quoting the Talmud. Or he says, you quote Jesus well, we're just quoting the Talmud. It's not the same. Okay? Because God clearly identified in His Word that He would raise up a prophet, liken him to Moses. And if you didn't hear His Word, you'd be cut off. Why? Because it's the same thing. If they didn't look at the serpent that had been raised up, they would die. The brass serpent represented sin judged. And when Christ was raised up on the cross, he was the innocent lamb of God that was without sin. Okay? And it showed that the judgment had been completed. Alright? Now, I want to show you a little more about this. Let's move over a little further. Now, Let's go to John chapter 4, Gospel of John. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Now the reason why Jesus never baptized with water because he was the one to baptize with spirit. All right. He left Judea and departed again unto Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now this is fascinating to me because he just gives this lecture to Nicodemus about how that a man must be born of water and of spirit and then comes the next issue with the woman at the well in Samaria that's why I say this water has a much deeper meaning than you could ever imagine right then cometh he to the city of Samaria which is called Sychar near the par parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph and Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. 
Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's, you know, times haven't changed much, have they? You see, the, the Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. Or half Israelite, I should say, and half Gentile. These were the remnants of the house of Israel when the Syrian soldiers had conquered the house of Israel and they had made Jewish women pregnant. And so therefore they were half Syrian, half Israelite. And because of this, the Jews hated them. Now I think it's kind of funny because today they say if your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish, but not by your father. That's still an insult. Still an insult. Okay? Because this is what was going on back then. In fact, they should have accepted the fact that they were Jews then back then because this is still the same Pharisees of today as it was 2,000 years ago. And their mothers were Israelite, but their fathers were Syrian. But Jesus never looked down upon them. Jesus answered and said unto her, If, you, if thou know, knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would give thee living water. Now we got a better, clear understanding now why Jesus said, Except a man be born of water and of spirit. All right, Now he's going to answer what he was saying to Nicodemus. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus says, Thou hast said, uh, well, has well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and thou saidest thou truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Wow. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, and when he cometh, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, and yet no one said, what, say, seek, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, went into the way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all the things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Isn't he the Messiah? See? Now she believed upon him. Why? Because even Moses said, What he says will come to pass. All right, now, oh, jeez, get this, guys, it's important. He gave her a sign to look for, except the man be born of water and of spirit. He cannot even see the kingdom of God, right? When Yeshua was dying on the cross, what happened? All right. What actually took place then? I actually had this pulled up a minute ago. What did I do with that one particular one? Let me just see. I'll have to go back over here. And okay. Uh, in the book 
of goodness. In the book of John, when Yeshua, here it is right here. All right, it's John 19. Let me pull it up over here where you guys can see it better. Okay. Still in the gospel of John, what do we have? John says in chapter 19, when he's talking about his crucifixion, he mentions two things. And I have always taught this. Um, let me see where it was at. It's in verse 37. When he was on the pole when he was on the, the cross, and uh, I use that word pole because they lifted up the brass serpent on the pole, right? All right, now, when he was dying on there, remember, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with the vinegar and put it, put it upon hyssop and put it... Uh, to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. And the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers, and brake the legs of the first and the other, and which was crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that, and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone in him shall not be broken. And again in another scripture saith, They shall look upon him whom they pierced. Now most people when we're looking over at Zechariah's prophecy, which is Zechariah 12, and it says in verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look, upon, look unto me because they have thrust him through. And the King James says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Most pastors always teach about Zechariah that they'll be looking at the nail prints that were in his hands and his feet. But any rabbi knows that it's not pierced in the way that you think of in the hands and the feet. It is a thrust through. And I have taught this for years. That it was actually what the Roman soldier did. It's when the Roman soldier drove the spear in his side that that was fulfilled. Now I had totally forgot all about that John had recorded this as well. And it's a compound fulfillment because yes, the scripture in Zechariah 12.10 uh, was fulfilled back 2,000 years ago, but it's also, Zechariah shows you that it's for a coming day when Judah would return to the homeland before the house of Israel would return to the homeland and they would come back not knowing their tribal order and they would look upon him whom they have thrust through and they would weep and separate every man to his own family. The house of David apart and their wives apart. The house of, of uh, uh, well actually let's just look at it here. All right. The house of Nathan apart, their wives apart. The family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart. The family of Shemites apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, their wives apart, which included the Sumerians, which is all here set up again today. Now the reason why it is recorded in family name is because God knew that in this day, People don't know for sure what tribe they belong to other than the Levites. Did you notice Levi is mentioned by his name and the Pharisees believe that they are descendants of Levi. 
Interesting. But Nathan and David is from the house of Judah. Shimei is, of course, the tribe of Benjamin. Okay? But the thrusting through was when the Roman pierced through his side, not his hands and his feet. And I didn't re realize that John had noted that. And yet I taught it this way for years to my Jewish people that the piercing... Because even with Tobia Singer, I made that clear to him. It's not his hands and his feet. It's his side. And why? Because he told the woman at the well, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you the water that you don't have to come here to drink anymore. Right? And so he was showing her a sign of the water. Just like he did in John when he says to Nicodemus, except the man be born of water and of spirit. And when his side was pierced, what happened? His water separated from his blood and it came out. The water and the blood were separated. I think that's in the Gospel of Matthew we understand that. And, and, and the thing is, when that water comes out, from his side, it was representing the water of life that he spoke to at the woman at the well. But not only that, it shows that the life, the Chaim that was in Christ, remember, he's the second Adam. He's the Adam that did not sin. And so just like it was with, 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 with Adam, Adam had the Eighth Chaim. He had the tree of life within him. And when Eve was born, there was no need to breathe in her nostrils the breath of life because she was born with that breath of life. But then God had to guard the way back to the tree of life because of Adam's descendants. If they put forth their hand on the tree of life and live eternally in a fallen state, it's a matter of redemption. Redemption is to bring something back. You lost it. You've got to bring it back. And man had lost his spiritual connection to God. Yes, we were still being born in this earth of water. But you had to be born not only through the womb of a woman, but you had to be born by the Spirit of Almighty God. You see, because you had a life, and in your life was a nephesh. It was a soul. The soul of man had a life, but there was nothing to quicken that soul, which is the Holy Spirit, the Chaim that was inside of Christ, that could come back upon the human being, that would quicken him. So when you look Upon this, upon this man, this Christ Jesus on the pole as Moses had lifted up the serpent on the brass pole and they could look earnestly and believe what they were seeing would heal them from the bite of the serpent so we can today look to this man Jesus Christ that was lifted up on a cross and we can look to him and realize that you can live eternally and that the bite of the serpent from the garden of Eden, Eden can be repaired and fixed and amended and where the serpent caused that fall in the garden of Eden now that fall is being repaired and the breach is being being sealed up by the very one that's on the cross in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago it is absolutely amazing. And everything, the thrusting through, it wasn't the prince in his hands and in his feet. The most important piercing of Christ was when they drove that spear in his side and it separated. Because why? You have to understand, when they put the nails in his hand, all right, that was to fasten him to the cross. But when his life come out of him, it was able, he was able to impart that eternal life. Here the tree of life was on the cross. When Moses lifted up the brass serpent, it was a serpent on the cross. But now it is the very tree of life on the cross. And he's there in order to impart that eternal life. Let me say this to you, my friends. I don't care where you are in the world today. 
It doesn't matter if you are Jewish, if you are Muslim, if you are Hindu, Zeke, James, whatever you might be, whatever religion you might be, you might be part of the Baha faith, anything that you want to be on this earth, if you would just take and look to what Yeshua said, if you would look earnestly and in your heart, just see him there on that cross and recognize that in him was the eternal life of Almighty God was living inside of him. And though you be a soul of a human being, that if you would earnestly look to him, he would fill you with his spirit. The Holy Spirit could come back upon you, which would quicken the soul within your being that would change you from being just born of the flesh, but now being born of the spirit of Almighty God. If you believe that and you want to know that you are saved, look to Him. And I will pray with you. And if you will look from your heart to Him and you will believe that He has truly saved you by the very life that He imparted back on you, believe it and you will receive it. Then be baptized. You know, I know normally it's being baptized first, then you receive the Spirit. But look, what did Paul say when he came across these that had already received the Holy Spirit? See? What doth hinder them? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, no telling who all might listen to this broadcast. Many believers, no doubt. Maybe some believers that have believed you, but they've never been filled with your Spirit. I pray, Father God, let the life that was in Christ Jesus, the Yeshua HaMashiach, our Father, may you impart that life unto them. If there be a Jewish brother or sister or Muslim, or one that is Hindu, or any of the other different religions of the world, and Native American beliefs, etc., whatever may be listening here this day or whenever they might hear these words. That if they can see and know that truly that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, died for them, and that He was put up on this cross, and that all we have to do is to look earnestly to Him and believe that He gave His life so that His Spirit could come back upon us. Receive that today. Receive Him. He will surely give you the Holy Spirit. I pray for them, Father, in earnesty, Father. I pray for this people that are listening all over the world that you might touch their heart. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Listen, friends, stand with us, won't you? We want to get back to putting the teachings out. I am just so pressed in my heart to share these insights that God gives to me with my own people, the Israelite people. We can't do that without your help and we appreciate your help. If you want to support this work, please do so. Visit our website, israelinewslive.org. You can donate there. Uh, if you have trouble there, you can always too uh, help us by even going to patreon.com forward slash israelinewslive. And, um, but as well, we have our mailing address here. And it doesn't have to be a donation either. Maybe you just have something that's on your heart. If you need prayer, um, always please email me, stephenbenoon at gmail.com. That's S-T-E-V-E-N-B-E-N-N-U-N -E -E at gmail.com. Uh, so if you guys have need of prayer, please always put that in the subject line. Because prayer is the most important thing to me that there is. Uh, you can also write us, though, according to our address here on the screen and behind us. Uh, 
and that's in Champions Gate, Florida. I don't live in Champions Gate, it's just where I have a box number, but you have to put pound 442 for the box number. We love you. Thank you for watching. I trust this has been a blessing to you. And, and if you could, do me a favor. If you have, whether it be a blog, a website, write about the things that we're doing. Mention, whether it be IsraeliNewsLive.org, mention our website there. Uh, or if you're, and, and as well, if, you're, if you are more passionate about the teachings that we do, and we'll try to get to where we're back doing it once or twice a week here on Danun Institute, um, share the channel with the people, Danun Institute. Uh, you can also share IsraelReturns.com uh, because the videos that we do here on Danun Institute are on the website IsraelReturns.com. They always post there. So share that with people. Write about the work that we do uh, so it will be a blessing to others. And I say this only if there's something you feel in your heart to do. I don't, I'm not asking people just to do it to do it. You know, I want to know that it's something that you feel passionate about as well, that this would bless someone. Uh, and yes, you have permission. If you want to share this video, uh, do share it. Share it with as many people as you possibly can. We appreciate that. God bless you. Thank you for watching. And those of you on live stream, I hope you were able to see. Uh, I know it doesn't always work the best, uh, especially the way we're set up right now, but we'll try to get that fixed as soon as I can. So much going on. Pray for my wife as well. Uh, she's having to start another six-month therapy campaign there. Uh, being in Europe, she didn't do the treatment the way she was supposed to there. Uh, laxed off, and this tumor started growing again. Uh, so she's got to do the six months of this treatment. And uh, I will. I talked to the doctors the other day, and uh, whoops, sorry, and got uh, the actual physical amount what it'll take to get get her through this next six months here. So maybe we might set up a little GoFundMe or something for her, uh, because unfortunately we don't have insurance in this country. We have it in Europe, but Europe still will not treat her with vitamin C therapy, uh, DMSO potentiation therapy as well with uh, glutathione. That's what works in her case. I know there's a lot of other treatments you can do, including, um, as some people have written us before, uh, you can do bacon soda, things like that. Uh, every cancer is different, and it just depends on the type of cancer you have. So even if people are telling you to do this or that, some people will say use marijuana. Uh, marijuana does treat cancer. There are cancers that marijuana will kill, but you have to know what works for the type of cancer you're battling. If you don't, and you think, like even vitamin C, vitamin C therapy doesn't work for every cancer. You have to know which one it works for. Uh, so just keep those things in mind. Find a, a local physician that believes in natural healing as well if you are battling any of these things. Uh, I just saw a prayer request the other day and uh, someone on Israeli News Live. I don't know if they watch this channel or not, but we will post it on Israeli News Live later this week. But let me just say to, to that brother, his wife was down to 75 pounds and he was asking prayer for her. Let's pray for her together, if you would. Those of you who will be watching, pray with me for this man. It was his love of his life. She's in very serious condition. She has cancer and uh, down to 75 pounds. And I would encourage the brother, when you do hear this message, brother, please, uh, I believe in prayer. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen cancers healed. All kinds of things I've seen by the hand of God through prayer. I know it is true. God will do these things. Uh, sometimes, though, the faith of the individual may lie in a doctor or help of some other sort. That's the way my wife is. Hers is more into the things that God has given naturally. But I want to pray with you, my brother. And I, I don't recall your name or your wife's name, but God does know. I saw it in the comments on the video, I think from either yesterday or the day before yesterday, him asking for prayer for his wife. I prayed then, but I want to pray together while we have believers as well. Heavenly Father, the brother that wrote in desperation for his wife, only 75 pounds, Lord. God, you're still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Would you please touch her, touch her body, touch her heart. Please heal this woman, Lord. I know he loves her just as I love my wife. 
And Father God, if there's something that could be done for her as well, whether it be natural or whatever, reveal it to this family that might give them a second chance in this life. We pray, Father, and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Blessings to you. Thank you for watching, guys, on live stream. And thank you for watching on Denon Institute of Biblical Research.